Hey Tina, thank you for joining me today. Uh, we appreciate you so much for coming. Oh, it's a complete pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me, Dilly. I'm really excited because I think you do such amazing work with your toxic prevent and everything and your, you know, the information you get out there and your protocols and things. Absolutely fabulous. No, I appreciate that so much. It's been a, been quite a fun journey. I was actually going through my calendar because I thought I need to remember when I first met Dr. Pierce. And I started my calendar. Would you believe the first time we ever met was on the 9th of December 2016, just when you began your MCAS and histamine journey? Goodness, was it that long ago? Yeah, that's how long I've known you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's gone in a flash, hasn't it? <laughs> it really has. When I saw the candle, I was like, this is just, this is crazy. And I, because when you, or when we were talking before we started the interview and you said, I began my journey in 2016, I was like, okay, I've got some surprising information to tell you about that. Oh, well, it's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Yes. That was where it all started for me. I must say. Can I, can I just though start by saying this to you? Tina, since I've known you in 2016, you have become one of my heroes, like my personal heroes, because your story behind how you've got into MCAS and histamine and looking at long COVID has been not only just an inspiration to me, but an inspiration to many of the people. And so when we were telling people that we were going to do this interview, I was like, and I, and I gotta be honest, I was pretty excited. I was like, this, I was like saying to my partner, I was like, I'm I'm gonna be interviewing one of my heroes today because I've known Tina for a while now and literally this is gonna be a fun interview. And so I think we should probably start with the first question, like a bit about you. Cause I think for the people that don't know you, what should they know about you? Oh, well. Where um, we it? <laughs> Gosh, oh, that's very sweet of you to say that. Um, it's been an extraordinary journey for me as well. Um, I started off uh, in general practice and uh, and I did general practice for seven years uh, whilst I had my three kids. Um, and it was it was an interesting time. I found it quite stressful. I found it not very satisfying. I found that I couldn't make people better. Um, I was just, I felt that I was just sort of pushing drugs on people, writing prescriptions covering up their symptoms and not getting to the root cause of their illness. Yeah. And also you had to do all of that in sort of seven to 10 minutes, <laughs> which was just so unsatisfactory. And, and I knew that all my patients had different genetics, different lifestyles, different beliefs, different guts, microbiomes. And we didn't even know what microbiome was in those days. And, um, you know, so this is, I qualified in 1983. So an awfully long time ago, I've been qualified 40 years this last summer. Wow. And, um, yeah, a long time. And it, yeah, I just didn't, I just didn't get the satisfaction out of general practice that I was hoping I would get. So I then was asked if I would uh, move into women's health and became a consultant in contraception and reproductive health. Yeah. And I, I did that in a heartbeat because I loved women's health and I loved seeing all these healthy women and helping them make the right choices for them and help them control their fertility and have babies when they wanted to have them, how many they wanted to have, with whom they wanted to have. And, you know, and it was just, it was great. I loved it. And, and I was given the opportunity to build a team and develop the services in Surrey, first East Surrey, then Mid Surrey, finally in the whole of Surrey. And it was great. I loved it. I worked with some fantastic people and we saw amazing people, patients, you know, young people coming into our clinics and uh, older women and so on. And at the same time, I developed an interest in the menopause, obviously. Um, and I was doing seeing an awful lot of menopausal women in my general practice years and then throughout contraception, mm -hmm. because you know, women who are perimenopausal still need contraception. So, yeah. Um, and then um, in 2016, when I was still doing all of this stuff, my youngest daughter, who'd not been very well for all of her life, and we couldn't quite put our finger on what was going on with her. Yeah. Um, she became super unwell in 2016. I mean, really worryingly awful, crippled with her condition. And with loads and loads of new symptoms, she had about 30 symptoms. And what had happened was she was so fed up of feeling chronically ill. Um, yeah. She'd had eczema from a child, you know, from a baby. Um, I used to spend, she, she remembers this, when she was like two and a half, um, I would get up in the night with her and she and I would sit and watch a video, you know, Disney, whatever, um, Pocahontas or something. And I'd hold her little hand. She'd be sitting between my legs and I'd hold her little hand. and We'd have a duvet over us in the middle of the night to try and stop her from scratching, you know. 
And um, anyway, so she we, we hoped she'd get better when she was going through puberty, but she didn't. So then we started to, we eliminated tomatoes and a few things from her diet and that helped a little bit. Yeah. Then she got swine flu when she was 16 and went to college and she was super ill with that. That seemed to really ramp up her symptoms. She started getting terrible migraine and ME kind of symptoms and just crashing out, coming home from college and crashing out and not being able to do her studying um, because she was so tired and um, and she always looked pale in all the photographs of my children there's two healthy looking little children with beautiful sort of rosy cheeks and then little Jessie who looked like a little uh, doll because she was so pale and wow. oh it was it was heartbreaking anyway so but it, when she was in 2016 she was a student nurse and she was so fed up of feeling chronically tired and unwell she decided to go for it and she started bulleting uh, superfoods and so it was spinach and avocados and tomatoes and all these high histamine things and uh, she was drinking this all day long and of course she was poisoning herself basically but we didn't know that yeah she was doing lots of exercise and um and she just became more and more toxic so she became more and more ill and her eczema got so bad that her she was all swollen like a bloated oh no, it was awful she was so bloated and um and all, with all this fluid retention from the inflammation and yeah. her asthma was dreadful if she moved her neck the skin on her neck just split and it was and her arms it was awful and um she was getting she was getting pots so she was hypotensive and fainting and feeling sick she'd wake up in the middle of the night with nausea because her histamine was so high rushed to the loo vomiting um she was getting oh she, she had for one week she didn't sleep for a week she had such uh, insomnia um and it Almond was a symptom yeah exactly so she had total insomnia for a week not a single second did she sleep for seven days and seven nights I mean absolutely to tortured I mean she was tortured by this she rang me up in floods of tears um it was on a Saturday afternoon at about four o'clock in the afternoon I remember it well I was doing a big dinner party so I was preparing all this food and this phone call and she's crying and she never does that. Jessie was so stoic. She was so used to being uh, never complaining about feeling unwell. You know, she was just amazing. She's an amazing woman. Yeah. And um, she, um, yeah, she rang me up. She was crying and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to come and get you. So she, she only lived about 15 minutes away. I jumped in the car and brought her home. She said, she said to me, I, I can't, I couldn't open my eyes when I woke up this morning and my tongue and my mouth is all swollen and I can't even drink water. And I said, you're having an anaphylactic shock. <laughs> and she said, no, mom, it's been like that since I woke up this morning. And I said, well, I've got, I'll come and get you. So I anyway, got to her home and she had dermatographism and she looked so unwell. And we sat her down, my husband and I sat her down and I, and we were trying to work out what was going on. Yeah. Um, I said to her, look, honey, you haven't eaten it. Look, we got her a straw. We were giving her lots of water to drink through the straw. And I said, um, I'm going to cook you. I've got some organic minced lamb. I've got some organic potatoes and carrots. I'm going to just cook you something really simple. You haven't eaten it all day. Uh, you know, let's get some food into you. And she sat there and she had some carrots and she was fine. And she had some potato and she was fine. And then she put some minced lamb in her mouth. And it was almost as if we had set her on fire. Wow. She was already dermatographic, you know, with redness. She just flared like uh, as red as anything. And... And my husband made the diagnosis, bless him. He's not medical, but he said, oh, it's like she's allergic to something. It's like histamine. <laughs> Literally, that happened within about 10 seconds of her putting the food in her mouth. Because, of course, wow. we, we know, don't we, that, that mince meat is full of bacteria, which release histamine. Yeah. So it was really super high histamine. And it, it sort of made the diagnosis. Anyway. I looked then went histamine intolerant. Somebody had said something nine years before to me. Nine okay. years. Nine years before. Okay. okay. So um, they said to me, do you think Jesse could have histamine intolerance? And I said, oh, that's interesting. I'll look it up. There was nothing about it. Yeah. So so what, what's nine years from that is uh, 2007. There was nothing. I couldn't find anything about it on the internet. So I just sort of filed it away in the back of my head. And um, when my husband said histamine, I suddenly thought histamine intolerance. So, of course, I looked again on the internet and there was a little bit more. There, is, there wasn't nearly as much as there is now, thank goodness, but yeah. there was a little bit more. Enough for me to start putting together these are her, all her symptoms, tick the boxes. You know, she was literally ticking everything. 
And so then I said, right, we've got to give you an antihistamine every day. But I was, I didn't know the doses. I didn't know, there was nothing about that. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll just give you, um, uh, we'll give you um, fexofenadine once a day, 180 milligrams, you know. And of course people can have it up to four times a day is the maximum safe dose. Yeah. So I was, I was way under treating her. And, um, and anyway, the, and we started looking for somebody to help us and we couldn't find anybody. <laughs> It was terrible. We saw six doctors and we we made an appointment uh, with this top immunology yeah. allergy specialist in London. It was disgraceful what happened. You know, we I took her into, he said she must stop having any antihistamines for three days before she comes to see me. And I was like, oh, but she's just starting to look like she might be getting a bit better, you know. So we had to, so we said, said to her, sorry, we have to do this to you, darling. Stop taking them for a few days. And, um, I took her along to London and he he did that because he wanted to do scratch tests on her arms, both her arms. And her, both her arms were covered in eczema. Yeah. And there was no way you should have done any testing on those yeah. arms. And I said, no, no, I don't think we should do that. And he came in and told his nurse, do it. I need this information. It's absolutely fine. So she did it. <laughs> And of course, it was useless because Jesse was so full of histamine. It was just like, you know, and he charged me 860 quid <laughs> for this consultation. And in the yeah. consultation, he turned to Jesse and he said to her, well, he said, he turned to me, actually. She's sitting there and he said to me, I think she's got a brain tumor. Are you, are you serious? I'm absolutely serious. He said, what? I think she's got a brain tumor. The fear that a parent must oh, fear when well, taking that. Luckily, yeah, the, the fear was in Jessie's face. Her eyes just, she just looked like a rabbit in the headlights, yeah. as you can imagine. I knew that she did not have a brain tumour. Yeah. So I was able to look at her, and in my split-second look at her, I conveyed, here's a twat, don't take any notice of what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she looked so relieved bless her heart. It was so disgraceful. It was so disgraceful. He had nothing to offer us. He didn't even recognize histamine intolerance and he was treating lots of people with eczema all the time. So anyway, we came away from that. Um, and then I found Professor Vic Kular, who is amazing. Yeah, he's, I met him personally, yeah. Oh, uh, he's yeah, amazing. Too. He's Not only is he the loveliest man, he's also a fantastic clinician, a fantastic surgeon. And yeah. he because he was interested in, is interested in interstitial cystitis, he was treating a lot of women who had histamine issues and muscle activation syndrome because that it goes together. Yeah. And, um, and so he was putting two and two together and coming up with four um, and saying, this is what these people have. And he learned all about it. So he was, he was a godsend for us and helped us to get Jessie better. And she lost half a stone in two weeks. And it was all water. It was just water. And you could see her shrinking as the inflammation was going down, as she was on the type one and type two antihistamines and things, and we were off the histamine foods and things. So she stayed at home with us for four weeks and we nursed her really um, until she felt well enough to go back. And I've got photographs on my phone. And when I sometimes accidentally come across them, it makes me want to weep to see how awful she looked and how sick she was, you know, but it makes me completely understand where every patient comes from when they sit down in the consultation and they have been ignored or told it's anxiety or um, gaslit or whatever the expression is, you know, yeah, for, yeah. But sometimes for decades. And then I say, no, I think we know, might know what you've got. Um, I know exactly yeah. the journey they've been through, you know. So anyway, so that that took me to 2016. And of course, once you start learning about something, you can't unlearn it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> so I started seeing histamine intolerant patients everywhere. I was di diagnosing four, five, six a week. And they were coming for contraception to me at that time off of HRT and I would take a history and that and I'd say, oh, I think I might know what's causing your IBS and your chronic headaches and your itchy skin and your insomnia. And they would burst into tears because they would be so relieved that it wasn't all in their heads, you know. So anyway, so then I started making people better. And that was such fun. It was so nice to do that. And it was a journey that we were on together because I was learning my craft as I went along. There's so much to learn now. Yeah. 
feel like I I feel like there's hardly time to sleep because there's so much to learn, really, <laughs> you know. And um, so anyway, so that that that's where that took me. And then in 2017, I gave up the NHS um, at in Surrey, and I carried on at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, where I worked in the big menopause clinic until the first shutdown lockdown, and then they they closed the clinic, unfortunately, and I haven't been back there since then. But um, I, um, yeah, when I heard about um, acute COVID um, and there was a, a post-mortem uh, paper that came out of Italy, I l- read the paper with great interest because we were all trying to learn about this, this novel virus. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and in, in it, it said um, that they were puzzled uh, because at post-mortem, the lungs had got heparin, uh, sorry, it, it had got bruising and bleeding, it had got clotting and it had got breakdown of uh, membranes and it had also got inflammation uh, present. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's mast cell activation. That's the cytokines, that's yeah. that the cytokines do. So I thought, well, these patients who are struggling with COVID and it wasn't everybody, it was just about 17, 20% of the population that had more difficulty maybe they're the patients, the 17, 20% who've got MCAS. And so I started thinking, well, then we should know how to treat acute COVID. Um, And when people were coming to me, uh, ringing me up and saying, I've got COVID, what do you think I should do? I'd say, well, if I were you, this is what I would do. I have no data to base this on apart from a hunch and uh, and the data from Italy, um, it's worth a try. It's not going to do any harm. You know, take vitamin D, high doses, vitamin C, selenium, zinc, magnesium, quercetin, which is a mast cell stabilizer. Take some antihistamines that you can buy over the counter one, four times a day. So loratadine or cetirizine or fexofenadine. And let me know how you are tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd ring me up the next day and they'd say, oh, I'm so much better. <laughs> I'm so much better. And some of them were really sick people. You know, they were, um, there was one chap, he had, was, had been a chain smoker all his life. He was an alcoholic. He had heart disease already with two stents uh, for coronary artery disease. And he was coughing and coughing and coughing. And anyway, the next day, by the next day, he'd stopped coughing and he was able to get out of bed and have a shower and get dressed. And um, yeah, so nobody needed oxygen or to go to hospital or died for who I saw. And I've treated about 100, I think, by now. And of course, Dr. Shankara Chetty in South Africa has found exactly the same thing, but he's treated 14,000 patients in the same way for acute COVID and nobody needed uh, any oxygen or to go to hospital so it, yeah so that was an interesting learning curve really yeah. see uh, I was laughing about what you said there a minute ago about the the antihistamine <laughs> usage with long covid because we were we were actually contacted and told by our governing body that we cannot mention the link between histamine and long covid even though we are a histamine like binder and we remove it we were given at the start we were told you were not allowed to make any conversation or talk about it. And Froxman were actually, they were, because they, they, someone had wrote a blog about it and saying, you're we're using Toxprem part of the protocol. And the team were like, oh, this is brilliant. We can say something about this. And they, and like we were talking about the link between histamine and using Toxprem, the histamine binder. And yes. they just went, no, 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 no. So we were like told, if you mention the word, covid or anything you will be told off so we just had to keep stump about what well, we just couldn't say anything and we had the exact same issue then i like you would get contacted and people would go well dilly isn't you know if, if i've got mcas or histamine overload you know it, and i've got long covid isn't that a histamine response and i was like yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a histamine response it's your it's the body you know body, the, the mast cells activating and releasing the cytokines and releasing the histamine to try yeah. and push the like you know the inflammation and create that barrier to stop the virus going through but if you've got mcas or you've got histamine before your symptoms are going to be way worse because your bucket's already full and yeah. then adding like a virus into it which is going to happen it's going to spill to the point where you're on the floor yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Gosh, I'm I'm horrified. I'm not surprised, but I'm horrified. <laughs> but you know, the 
the yes yeah, so there were some interesting things that happened because i contacted various authorities to say actually i i'm treating acute covid and i think this could be really important for everyone to know and nobody got back to me <laughs> so um various you know people in the public um in the public's view who had responsibilities towards public health and they didn't get back to me so um that was very disappointing and i was i thought they would be ringing me up the next day every time my phone rang I thought it'd be number 10 Downing Street telling me you know saying come in come and tell us about this treatment you're giving people for acute Covid but nobody did um anyway so then in the August um 2020 people started talking about long Covid and the symptoms yeah. and I was contacted by this very nice BBC um reporter and she was very sweet and she said I think I, you know, I've heard you talk about MCAS and histamine intolerance. And she said, I think I've got that, but I think I've got it, it after COVID. And she said, I've been on Facebook groups for long COVID. And I think that they may have it too. And I said, well, that's really interesting. I said, because that makes sense to me. You know, it's just a post-viral um, condition, really. And COVID is a virus. So, you know, it was the same for, for people post Epstein-Barr virus, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I got very interested and I went on to BBC Look East and I said um, I got three minutes on BBC Look East and I said look I'm very interested in knowing if, if some patients with long COVID people with, suffering from long COVID could download this free app it's called the People With app it's a brilliant app um, and put in there your profiles of all your symptoms for me and then I can see if it's got the same profile of symptoms as MCAS and then that will maybe give us more clues about how to treat long COVID. Well, 2,200 people downloaded the app within about 48 hours, Wow! which was fantastic. I was so grateful. And then we could see that all their symptoms were the same as the mast cell activation patients. That's fascinating. Yeah, they really were. So I was like, then I felt absolutely morally obliged to open a long COVID clinic because I thought, well, I really think I can treat these people. And all the news and everything one heard of was no one knows what to do with them. No one can treat them. They're all just languishing on their sofas. And, you know, and I thought, no, I think I do know how to help them. So I need to have a go. So I opened a clinic on the 1st of November 2020. And um, and I didn't advertise it, but I must have mentioned it to somebody because it was booked up till the end of March within 36 hours. <laughs> wow. so it was like, oh, my, I only put it in my diary till the end of March. <laughs> and it was gone. It was completely gone. All the appointments were gone. So that was interesting. Anyway, then I, I wanted to know, had the virus, had um, COVID um, exacerbated pre-existing MCAS or had it caused it? in some people and it, i would say 99 percent of my patients had pre-existing undiagnosed untreated mcas um and that covid was just like the last final straw as you say the histamine bucket was pretty high already um there were a couple of patients who had no previous history and who responded incredibly quickly to the treatment yeah. and were able to go back to a full normal diet and everything very quickly within a couple you know, within a week almost you know just doing the right thing sorted them out very quickly but uh, anyway, so then I started my adventure of trying to learn as much as I possibly could about how to help um, this, these lovely group of patients that I now had. And, um, and so I started to learn about, um, I started, well, yeah, about genetics. Um, and I started working with Life Code GX and getting reports on their methylation cycles, their histamine metabolism, et cetera. So really understand and drill down. And I started working with in vivo to look at their gut and the gut analysis um, because the microbiome is so important. Um, and uh, and then, you know, looking at things like using Toxoprevent and low dose naltrexone and and all of the things that we've now learned about, which is and there's so much more to learn. It's just it's mind boggling, really. But anyway, so, yeah, so that's that's what's happened with me, really. Um, so it's been a very interesting journey and now of course patients who book themselves into my clinic often have uh, been uh, vaccine injured and they've had adverse reactions to the vaccine and many of them have uh, MCAS type reactions yeah it's just like it's it's crazy when you enter the arena of histamine the interlinking interlinking of so many conditions and symptoms are just unparalleled but you know when you were talking about like how the patient being heard was such a big thing you know one, one thing you said yes uh, when i was listening to one of your interviews and you said 70 percent of the population have mcas and i heard that 
And I was like, that's incredible as a fact. That's a, just as a fact, that's incredible. But then in one that, I don't know about you experiences, but I get so many phone calls where because of like MCAS or because of the histamine, people gain food phobia. Yeah. And like they, if you look at what the person's going through, and because they don't feel heard or they can't feel like, you know, like they, because they literally, you're like, well, if I eat this, I blow up. And people are like, it's a food intolerance. And it's like, it's not a food intolerance. This is my histamine bucket being filled. People think you're a nut job. They literally just will ignore you. And then, like, I speak to these patients and they end up crying because they're like, Dilly, I go to a supermarket. I can't eat anything. So then I'll like, my friends go to a restaurant i'll just sit there with like not eating anything i can't drink the wine tap water hurts me even more and that fact we said 70 percent of the population that is incredible yeah. yeah it is it is incredible and when you think about it they get multiple symptoms in different systems which might vary from time to time um yeah. week to week yeah. Um, and um, and will de depend the severity will depend on what the particular trigger has been yeah. and how bad their histamine is. So sometimes they can eat something that's quite high histamine because their bucket is very empty, so it's fine. And then another time they can they can't because yeah. it's already overflowing or almost overflowing, and then it just tips it over. So they get confused. Can I eat that? Can't I eat that? What's you know? Why have I now reacted? But when you think about it, in the, a lot of the GP surgeries, one of my patients today told me that her GP has a notice on the door that says you have 10 minutes and you can only bring me one question and one symptom now imagine these patients have multiple symptoms yeah and you can't put the picture together it's like you need all the pieces of the jigsaw to be able to put it all together and make the picture to see what to do so if you have one if i said that to my patients and they came and they just said i've got a headache i go okay i wouldn't have any clue what to do with them but if they say well i've got a headache and i've got some gut issues and, and at night my skin's really itchy and you know you start to to put it together properly and do your use your proper sort of clinical acumen yeah and to to put the picture together anyway it's been very interesting the whole last four years has been fascinating and i also i i contacted um the lady who was in charge of the long covid nhs clinics and yeah. i i had to sort of really work quite hard to get a contact with her and organized a sort of hour zoom with her and i said um i said you know i've opened this long covid clinic and people are responding really well. And I know you're going to open a whole load across the country. And I'd love to share my experience with your doctors and your teams. And I think that would be really helpful. And she didn't want to know, really. <laughs> she said, she said, do a randomized controlled trial and then come back and tell me when you've published. Wow. And I said, I can't. I haven't got the money. I haven't got the time. There isn't time for these people need help. These people need help now. And I've I've written papers and things that have been published before, and it can take five years to publish a paper yeah. in some of the magazines, you know, yeah. and the medical journals and things. It can take two, three years. They, these people didn't have two, three years to wait. They needed help now, and they were responding well. And so it was like, oh, I just couldn't believe it. I was so disappointed. But I did organize a Treat Long COVID um, international conference. So I did that in June of yeah. 2021 and it was a two day conference and over 2000 people came to my conference online. It was fantastic. I made it free for all the patients and for the doctors or healthcare professionals. We said, just make a donation if you want to. Yeah. So some, some did and some didn't. So, you know, I wasn't doing it to make money. I wanted to get the word out. And I had some very interesting speakers. Dr. Lawrence Afrin gave a lecture on MCAS and that was my wow the paper i read that it's impressive okay yeah, yeah. yeah carry on. sorry yeah. sorry so he was my, my one of my main goals for doing the conference was because i wanted to get him in front of the camera <laughs> uh, you know it's saying what he says about mcas and educating everybody about mcas so um he was brilliant and i had oh i had some really wonderful speakers um uh yes all sorts of people who were investigating and trying to learn about what was going on with long covid and how to treat it we had somebody from in vivo talking about the gut and the microbiome we had somebody um, we, we also presented uh, the findings for uh, the genetic side of things and everything. It was really good. That it was really good. Amazing. Yeah, it was good. Uh, just to push the conversation along now, I've got a topic I want to talk a bit more about because oh. I think it's something that I'm seeing a lot more of. And it's probably, you know, one of the main parts of your business because you talked about menopause and 
it's scary to look at the symptoms of menopause and then the symptoms of histamine. If you put them side by side, the correlation is just mind blowing. So I want to like, because a lot of people don't understand it. So I want you to explain what, how is histamine and menopause linked? Right. Well, it's a very good question. And it's one that challenges a lot of women for things when they <laughs> have, if they happen to have a tendency to MCAS and they maybe see themselves as being very healthy and fit and having no real issues. But when they get to the men perimenopause period, they can then start to have MCAS issues. Yep. But they think it's menopause because, as you say, the symptoms are so similar. Mm -hmm. Hot flushes, palpitations, anxiety, insomnia. You know, yep. it's so similar. Um, and the, what is happening is when oestrogen uh, in the perimenopause, estrogen starts to fluctuate wildly yeah. from minute to minute. And it's the fluctuations that cause the symptoms. And um, and one of the things that high estrogen does is it releases histamine into yeah. the body. So so if you're if you're getting a massive uh, increase in in estrogen suddenly your histamine will go up and and of course that then causes hot flushes and night sweats and everything that the high the fluctuating estrogen causes yeah so women women put all of their symptoms down to the perimenopause they go to a, a, a clinic a doctor a gp to get some hrt and they're given some hrt and of course they don't always get better because the estrogen in the hrt is pushing their histamine up even higher and so they go back and they say, I'm not any better. I thought it was going to be the answer to everything. And it's not. And I'm actually worse. And a lot of clinics all around the country will then just say to them, well, you need more estrogen. So they give them even more estrogen. And it's like, no, they don't need more estrogen. No. They need less estrogen. They need to get their histamine under control first and then start cautiously adding in little amounts of estrogen, slowly doing the HRT. It is very possible to have MCAS and be on HRT and to be settled and to be well managed. But you have to do it in a very methodical and you know logical way. And you have to sort out the MCAS and the high histamine first and then start some low doses of estrogen and HRT and gradually build it up until you're getting the right optimal treatment for both, you know? Yeah. And, and then these women feel amazing. Um, and there's no reason for a woman who has histamine issues not to benefit from the fantastic benefits of HRT. You know, we know that even within six months of starting HRT, women's all-cause mortality risk goes down. It's that, it's that protective, even within yeah. six months, it makes a difference. And women who go on HRT and stay on it live three and a half years longer on average than women who don't. Wow. And which is, you know, quite significant, especially when you consider they're well women. They're not they're not living three and a half years longer with dementia and, yeah. uh, or, you know, Parkinson's and things because the HRT reduces the chances of having all of that quite significantly. So, uh, yeah, so, so I see an awful lot of women who have been elsewhere um, to various big clinics around the country, and they've been given massive doses um, of sometimes, I kid you not, um, doses that are like eight times the maximum dose that we would normally give of estrogen. <laughs> and, and, they, and they're still, and they're getting worse. They're obviously getting worse and worse because it's just pushing their histamine up. But we, we unravel all of that and we sort it out and um, and make them better, which is very satisfying. But um, yeah. It's like I because uh, because one thing that I was quite intrigued by was that we now know because like, when people are taking Toxaprevn on menopause, because we've had like a few patients from you that have come over and been like, Dr. Pierce has recommended Toxaprevn. What the protocol should I do? They're like, so give me this protocol. Can I check it? And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. And then some of them, when I'm speaking to them, they'll talk about they they had histamine before. And you, you find that when if someone's got MCAS or histamine intolerance, I like to call it overload. But if they have that, that the menopause makes it much worse. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for some women, um, they're not they're not obvious um, MCAS patients until they get to the perimenopause. Um, so there is sort of grumbling along and they have a few little, you know, when you dig into their history, there are a few indicators that the, yes, they have had issues, mm -hmm. but it's not been too bad and it's not really um, been detrimental to their quality of life and it yeah. hasn't stopped them doing too much. But then when they get to the perimenopause, whoosh, it all gets much worse and yeah. they're suddenly 
can't, you know, they're like, what is going on with me? You know, I can't, I can't, I can't, I used to be so fit and healthy and now I'm do I can't do anything. And well, you know, and we go from there. But um the, it's so much is in the history. You yeah. have really good history. And if you look for it, you will find you will find all sorts of things, exposure to mold. We talked about that a little bit earlier on, didn't we? Yeah. Well, uh, how moldy our housing stock is in this country. <laughs> you know, there's so much mold and dampness. It's terrible. And so people exposed to mold, they get CIRS. They, you know, have high histamine levels, lots of inflammation. Um, and if people who've had childhood trauma, um, that can be a big trigger for their mast cells, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Ep Epstein-Barr virus, Lyme's disease, um, and now COVID. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, mm, there's plenty of work. <laughs> no, time uh, yeah. no time to retire. <laughs> no, I understand completely. But do you know what? You know, you, you use that word trauma, and I was just thinking about it. I've been thinking about it a lot recently, about the, the trauma aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And... You know, we look at, you know, when you're, when you're in a, as, as a clinician, you'll look at traumas and what brought them onto that period there and, you know, why they've got that histamine symptoms. But I always say to people, histamine intolerance, MCAS, all this stuff is trauma within itself. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it exacerbates past traumas because it becomes the worst part of it. But whenever we kind of get those traumatic patients, I always say to them, listen, you will get better. And people like, they, they can't, they just don't, they, they don't understand the words because when you say you will get better because, you know, you said seeing a clinician takes three, two years or three years or five years, like going through the medical system, you can just get lost because, you know, if, if a GP saying you've got 10 minutes and one question, you, you're going to get lost in the system. So that yeah. becomes trauma. And like, essentially, if you're being told that you're actually giving someone trauma, you're saying, you know what? No one cares about me. Yeah, absolutely. You stop, you stop caring. It's so traumatizing, the whole thing. And so many women I see for menopause, never mind MCAS, put that aside. Yeah. Come in and they've been given they've been given antidepressants. Yeah. And what they need is HRT. It's because their hormones are out of balance. And they and these poor women, they go on, they go on these antidepressants. They don't, they they they're not happy to go on them because they feel that they're not depressed yeah but yeah you know something isn't quite right and um and so then they think oh well i'll try them you know and of course they don't work um and then you've got the problem of trying to come off them um i would say 80 percent of the patients who come to a menopause clinic are already on antidepressants having just been given them by the the gps yeah and what they wanted what they really need is the hrt so um, yeah, so that that is traumatizing in itself, and the patients who have MCAS are very traumatized because most of them have been ignored or told that they are um, hypochondriacs or they're making it up, or um, or what else happens is they stop telling people how they feel yeah. because they don't want to look yeah. like the party pooper all yeah. the time, you know, and the, they don't want to um, seem like they're moaning all the time and they're they're a hypochondriac, so they just yeah. say nothing, so they're suffering inside silence and my heart just breaks for them really because it's just but you know one good thing I keep looking for the good and everything and the um the silver lining of long covid is that it has shone a big light on muscle activation and histamine yep. issues agreed and so that has made it now much more commonplace. And of course, if you educate the patients, they can then educate the carers and the doctors. Yeah. So the, the patients know much more about it than most of the GPs and doctors out there. But if they're willing to listen to their patients, they can learn because there's a lot of information now available. There's no excuse, really. Um, and there's lots of people like me in my clinic. Who we're very happy to help people. If somebody has any questions, they can ring us up and we can, you know, very happy to spend some of our time explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it, how, what the evidence is, et cetera. But we, you know, there's so much evidence now to help uh, with patients with this condition and great products like Toxaprevent, which I just love. I love Toxaprevent. Yeah, I have, I it's that. All like, you know, it's it, with, with this, with MCAS and histamine issues, there isn't one magic bullet. 100%. It's a combination of a whole load of things. And what works in one person isn't always going to work in another person. And you have Agreed. to very you have to be very patient and walk through very slowly, trying different things out in a methodical, as methodical a way as you possibly can, 
um, and you know working out what keep, what to keep, what doesn't work, let go, um, and trying different things. But certainly, tox prevent is is fantastic. And I think one of the really helpful things is the tell us a bit more about the mycotoxin detox. You know that that is helpful because getting rid of the mycotoxins is sometimes problematic. You know, quite difficult for people. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with Toxprint. When we were doing the research in 2006 and looking at how it worked, that was part of it. Because, you know, you know, cleaning agents, like the sprays, a lot of them actually have bentonite in them. So they put bentonite clay into them. And because of its ability to bind up mildew, because of that stone, it kind of binds to water. So I remember, I don't know if you remember when I was doing my webinar and I was talking about making sure you drink enough water. That's yeah. why, because it will absorb the water, but also in the actual structure of the clinoctololite, because it's not like a, a disc or anything. It's like a, a cube, I would say, and it can actually encapsulate the mycotoxins. And, you know, actually our zeolite, we use it for human purposes, but part of our processes as well is that we sell to uh, farmers because a lot of the aflatoxins and ochratoxins, including A and B, go into chickens and into cows. So when the chickens and the cows eat the feed, which has got the mold and mycotoxin in there, then the human eats it. That's how we consume it. So what we did was we went, we went first went to animals, then we thought, well, people are still going to eat no matter where they're going to eat from. So we went to the humans, and then that's how we worked out that we were binding basically not just the molds but the mycotoxins the ochotoxins the aflatoxins and that's been a really powerful tool because you know you you were talking about the options and this is what i say to a lot of people is like when they're taking toxaparen it's it's not a case you know you're going to suddenly get miraculously better you've got to remember you've spent 10 15 years with this problem or your histamine buckets just kind of built up slowly it's not just you know one day you've suddenly got the symptoms it's a build-up of, of histamine over time yeah. and so for us to reverse that could take three months it could take a year we don't know how long it take but what we can guarantee you is you'll gradually get better and i yeah. think that's that's such a hard message. I don't know about how you find that, Tina. Like, do you find that really, when you're trying to like treat people, you say, just give it time? Because I think some people just want this like quick fix and it's like, it's just not going to happen. Like antihistamines are great because you can prescribe an antihistamine, it would turn off the histamine receptor and the symptoms would disappear, but it's not going to detox the histamine. It's not going to pull the histamine out. Yeah. And that's why I would say to people, like if you, because people are like, oh, Dilly, should I take my antihistamine? I'm like, yeah, take it. Like take cetrazine hydrochloride, take lorotidine. If someone's um, prescribed you for lorotidine, take it. It's gonna support you, but you need to make sure that you're looking at the triggers. You're mm -hmm. then you're looking at the binds that you're using, and you're reducing your histamine load just so your immune system can balance itself. Calm down, Calm down. yes, exactly. Calm down. <laughs> you know, yeah, sorry. Jesse, yeah. Jesse, um, my daughter, who is why i'm here really yeah. um she uh she's got a little two-year-old oh, wow. absolutely adorable completely so you're a nana tina I, I, yeah i'm a nana exactly <laughs> I'm a nana and i've got three i'm a nana to three children which amazing. is amazing i just absolutely it's the best thing ever but um little eva she's so funny she's been a real speaker talker she she's talked in proper sentences since she was about 12 13 months old I kid you not wow. and um and she when she was about 15 16 months old she was walking and she was she would if we were having a serious conversation Jesse and I she'd come in and she'd go calm down guys please calm down <laughs> <laughs> and I think of, I think of her when I'm saying to the, the patients we want to calm down these <laughs> calm down your muscles <laughs> I think you should get a poster of her and like stick it yeah. in your office. I've heard of just her exclaiming, calm down. Calm and you, down. Just, you should just point at that post and say, this is what you need to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. But, it, you know, you're right. You, you do have to be patient. And much as we would love to just wave a magic wand and say, right, you know, we're going to do this, this, this and this. And you're going to be better next time I see you, you're going to be so much better. Um, it's more of a sort of gradual thing for some people. You hit you hit the nail on the head straight away, and it's just amazing when that happens. Yeah, um, I had a lady this morning in my clinic um, who has mastocytosis. Okay, and she she had been feeling grumbling, unwell, really all her life, and she was in her mid fifties now. And um, and she saw me in February, and I said, oh well, you know, we we need to 
to basically put the same principles for mastocytosis. Um, and, um, and she's been taken care of in the NHS for mastocytosis, but they hadn't suggested some of the things that I then suggested. I put her on LDN and it was transformative. Yeah. I mean, when I saw her six weeks later, she was like, oh, I never thought this one in my whole life. <laughs> this is amazing, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then gave her some HRT and she's just thriving. She's thriving. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just, it's so exciting to see that. It's so exciting, yeah. It's like the small um, interventions. Okay, which leads me on to my next question, because you raised something earlier. You were talking about the role of the gut with histamine overload. And because we talk a lot about, you know, the idea of a leaky gut, the increase in zonulin and the permeability. Mm -hmm. And I think the term leaky gut has become like a, a it's like a, before it was like a dirty word. You, you never said it because if you said leaky gut you were a quack yes but now when we say look you've got a leaky gut because we know that it's linked with MCAS we know it's linked with histamine so in your opinion from all the research you've done what do you what's the role of the gut in histamine and MCAS gosh it's it's huge it's huge how long have we got <laughs> <laughs> well the, I mean the, the basic principles are that the mast cells line everything don't they they are so we've got such a huge surface area in our gut i mean it's massive isn't it with the, all the little villi so the huge surface area and there are little mast cells all lining all of that and the the membrane itself is one cell thick that's all we have in our gut one cell yeah. thick to, to stop any any of the toxins getting into our bloodstream so it's it's really pathetic in a way i mean it has to be that because of course we've got to absorb digested food. And so that's reasonable, but you, you know, anyway, so, so you've got all these mast cells sitting there. And of course, if there's histamine coming through down the pipe uh, with the food, um, then they're going to start firing and releasing cytokines, which is called, going to cause inflammation in that gut wall. Yeah. And then you've got, instead of having lovely soldiers all standing next to each other. Um, in fact, I liken it usually to, um, to a Victorian walled garden. So you can imagine if you're in a walled garden, it's pretty sheltered from the wind and it's, it's pretty good. But if you, that's as long as there's mortar in between all the bricks. And if the mortar has fallen out, then when the wind blows, it's just gonna come into the garden yeah. so it's like that. So when, when the br bricks are swollen, when the cells are swollen with the um, cytokines, they're not going to be butted up against each other properly and there's gonna be gaps. And that's the leaky gut, basically. And then you've also got the microbiome. You've got some bacteria that actually release histamine. And so and are, are signs that there is high inflammation in the gut. So it's very useful, actually, to look at the microbiome and to, to uh, try and balance everything down. There's the sodium chromoglycate is very useful as a mast cell stabilizer in the gut. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not absorbed into the bloodstream. I think only about 4% is absorbed and 96% just passes through the gut. But because these mast cells are literally standing right up against the wall of the gut, they do get affected by the sodium chromoglycate. And I've seen some incredible results from giving people that. Um, and as with also the Toxaprevent, I always think of Toxaprevent like a very big, large, complex molecule with but with a black hole in the middle and in that black hole, it sucks everything in. <laughs> and that's where you, you know, just like in the universe or these black holes, things disappearing into the black holes, you've got your, your, uh, you know, your heavy metals and your poisons and your toxins and your mycotoxin and everything going into that black hole as it just passes through the gut. I mean, so clever. So that, clever. Yeah. That is like, cause that's how we describe it as well, because you know, your, your basic, your immune system or the, or the mast cells are releasing that cytokine storm and the histamine's being released. And what, because people have got this idea that histamine's bad. It's not actually bad. It's, it's creating inflammation because it's trying to protect your body from adding extra things in. And people will say to me, like, why do I feel more tired sometimes? And I'm like, that's your body saying to you, you need to shut down go to sleep and I say like when you're having a bad day I don't know about you personally I've like said we've got like a company rule here right if you are having a bad day and we see it from our colleagues where they're like having a bad day I say to them just go home I'm like just please just shut your computer off and go home because I know what will happen you'll just continue to have a bad day and that's what histamine's doing it's like a it's like a beacon or a siren saying listen mm -hmm. bud something's going on 
you've got these problems, we need to calm it down. And yeah. as you start to kind of use the binder, like the histamine binder and talk to bind to the histamine, all the sodium, um, sodium side of things, as you start to reduce that inflammation, your gut starts to heal and then all the symptoms like it's like a domino effect you yeah. start to get better but when your condition gets worse it's, it's a domino effect as well because your condition way. gets worse it, yeah. i always say it's a domino effect either way you look at it so you're yeah. stacking it back up again or you're yeah. pushing it down and sometimes the difficult thing is working out what the trigger was so i mean you know and and one of the basic principles of of treating and helping people with mcas is to try and work out what the triggers are and avoid them so elimination of triggers is key. So it could be a perfume, it could be stress, it could be, you know, whatever. Uh, EMFs, you know, 5G, Wi-Fi. I've got yeah. patients who are sensitive to their mobile phone. They can't even touch their mobile phone. Wow. And um, but but you know, with time, their mast cells come down and then they can and and everything is is okay again. But uh, it's working out the triggers and um, and one of the triggers is the spike protein. And uh, yeah, so you have, about this, yeah. We have to clear the spike protein. We have yeah. to clear protein and there's something called augmented nac which yep. um, is really useful for getting rid of 99.8 percent of the extracellular spike protein can be denatured by it and then you can you know your liver can work on it metabolize it away and you pee it out so i would recommend that to people the other thing that i use uh, a lot of is this little thing here my little companion oh wow arc microcurrent device because you know when people are exhausted it's usually a sign that their mitochondria are dysfunctional and they haven't not making enough energy and what's really fascinating is every single cell i mean nature is just amazing isn't it every single cell in our body has a hundred thousand mitochondria in it yeah and it's making the atp and we actually need to make and use 70 to 80 kilograms a day of atp every day which is more than we weigh i mean that's just incredible and um but if you're so if you're not if you've got mitochondrial dysfunction because you're you know unwell you've got mcas you've got covid whatever you're um you're they're not going to function at optimally and you're not going to make 70 to 80 kilograms of atp a day yeah and your body's going to have to rationalize and prioritize the really super important things that it needs to have the energy for and things like reducing inflammation and repairing and healing yeah. is, is the extracurricular stuff so it won't do that um so this little device is a microcurrent device you wear it for at least three hours a day um and i usually wear it at night when i'm asleep so it's done and dusted and um and it produces this microcurrent which increases your atp production three to five fold wow do which is a bit mind-blowing. sorry do you, do you feel more energized yes i honestly i think it's it really helps i i forgot mine somewhere for two weeks and i was distraught because my rosacea got really bad during that two weeks and just because i wasn't reducing inflammation all the time i think that that's interesting you say that about the inflammation because i think people always assume that like if they do all this that that's it it's the end of the conversation and yeah. i always say to people like I, I would love to like i know it's it's bad business when you say like you know what you will get better and come off tox i always tell people you'll come off it and my colleagues are like dilly like that's a really bad business choice you want people forever and i say no 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 i goes i goes you know karma it, it's a good thing when you help someone but i always say to people just like using that device there are other ways that you can you need to do on a regular basis like you're not going to the gym you go if you're consistent you'll see the results and it's the same with you know following a protocol from yourself from us but it's like it's those small little changes like using that device or yeah. doing breathing like breathing exercises like i'm a big believer in breathing exercises like i'll do it over a cup of coffee because it allows me to re-energize my soul and re-enter my system but the thing is it's that fear of being able to actually do it in the first instance it's that first step and like I, I don't know. I, I just feel like society's become so much more kind of like not like terrified of a lot of that side of things. And I think like, you know, they're just scared to make the jump to being better because we're kind of not happy being sick, but we're just being our bodies are like, you know, we've just lived with sickness for so long, which that's the only life that we know. Mm, I know it's it. I think I'm really trying to encourage people um, 
and myself to live as natural a life as possible to you know have organic food if you can find it if you can afford it um better to have less of it and have it organic than i think to have all the pesticides and insecticides and things sprayed on it um and to um and to not have any processed foods um you know we never get takeaways we never we don't buy ready meals we just have everything freshly prepared and um and grounding is important so every morning i go outside and i look at the, the brightest part of the sky and yeah. in the, in the spring summer and or early autumn i go out barefooted and i stand on the grass and now of course it's wet and windy and and not so nice but i go out and put my hands on the grass so i'm still grounding myself but I'm doing it with my hands. I have a grounding mat underneath my um, keyboard at my computer. Um, I, we have um, we have structured water in our house, yeah. um, which is fabulous. Uh, so we bathe in it, we eat, drink it, we you know cook with it. Uh, we filter the water as well, so we get rid of the fluoride and the bacteria and the you know to toxins and things that are in it. So we try and be as uh, as authentic as possible to nature really and and I think getting out in nature is important that's something I don't do enough because I'm always working at my desk but you know going out for a walk in the woods even if you can just do it for 10 15 20 minutes touch the trees they give you hormones they give you they give you electrons you know we need three million electrons a day apparently to be replenished for our cells to be healthy and if you touch the ground in split second you're given three million well, it's um, you. You know, you actually, you actually, we brought the conversation up earlier about vitamin D, and you know, because we were doing, cause like, we just brought a product out called Vitamin D. It's, um, vitamin D is calciferdiol, so it's not cold calciferol. It's D three, but calciferdiol form, so it goes directly into the kidneys. And one of the papers was from a hormone council, and it was looking at the role of vitamin D and hormones. And I, you know, I now know, like in my personal experience, that if you do have histamine issues, MCAS or whatever it is, vitamin D3 um, or vitamin D, should we say, plays a major, major role because it actually links the innate and adaptive immune system. And everyone just focuses on like bone health and, you know, oh, it's good when you're going to get cold. But vitamin D is a hormone. It's a, it's a hormone. It's in the body. Your body needs it. It's like, mm -hmm. but we're trapped inside, like me and you, okay? You're sat behind your desk. I, I, I dread to see how many hours you're behind your desk. And you've got, you know, lights above you. You may have the, the window open because it's getting darker. That will close. I've got my lights in front of me. And you actually don't get enough sun. And honestly, like the amount of conversation that people give me, they're like, oh, Dilly, I don't need to take vitamin D. I went on holiday for two weeks. I've got enough vitamin D from my holiday. Or I had the summer, the sunshine, you know, I think there was a doc, famous doctor on um, Instagram and he was saying, you'll get vitamin D from X. I was like, it's 80 IUs. Your, your skin can consume 10,000 IUs in 10 minutes when you stand in the sun. And you're telling, you're comparing that, that to, an egg. to an egg. And I was like, we're, we're, our, our, you know, our ancestors, like people talk about ancestral diets and stuff, but our ancestors were, were in the fields grinding in the sunshine in the wind natural no pesticides or anything around they were in the mud grabbing that nutrients in and so but if you say the words like you know tina if you said to people go touch a tree they'll be like no and you're like did you know what your ancestors used to do they literally used to dig into the ground okay life expectancy wasn't as good but that was for other reasons like scurvy and things like that but now we've got vitamins and supplements things available to us but they were still feeling much better and they, they were strong they were working 14 15 16 hour long days yeah yeah yes 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 and yeah and it, i think there's there's one tribe they used to if somebody was sick in their tribe they used to dig a hole in the ground put them into the ground up to their neck and leave them for a few hours and then come back and get them out and they'd be better <laughs> and oh, you know, no, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was true you know because the electrons coming out of the earth the mother earth just gives us all these electrons and, and our body needs electrons we need three million a day to replenish for our cells to be healthy we are two million volts walking around attached to a few cells basically yeah. 
And that's how all our cells communicate with each other through microcurrents. And that's how homeostasis is maintained through microcurrents. And that's why this little device, I just absolutely love it. Um, and, and I've seen some incredible results with it. Incredible. And it's doing all of these things to help yourself be as in, in a, a sort of state of balance in homeostasis as much as possible um, for it for as long as possible. Um, and uh, and that helps also to keep your mental health, you know, and I think it's good for your mental health to go out into nature and touch trees, actually. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Very good. You know, just to 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 be closer to the earth, really. Yeah. And yeah, there's so much stuff that we do that's wrong, like our, you know, our shoes are all insulated, so we don't touch the, the ground and just all of that stuff, you know, I'm just, yeah, I like to get back to nature. No, I, I, I appreciate that so much. And I think I, I've just got one final question for you. Well, yeah. one to two final questions for you. We're going to put an ending to this, but, you know, with HRT, you talk mm -hmm. about the, you know, because it, with, with, you know, it can exacerbate issues. What? If, in your opinion, if 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 someone's taking HRT, because I get to a lot where people are on, you know, HRT and their their symptoms are much worse. In your opinion, what would you recommend that the person do to mitigate the histamine symptoms? So, well, I think I take the approach that you have to manage the histamine issues first, mm -hmm. if you can, um, and sometimes that means reducing the HRT they're on for a bit. Um, because you're fighting a losing battle, you know, yeah. if you if, you, if they're on quite a reasonable dose. So generally maybe reduce the histamine a little bit, the, sorry, the estrogen a little bit, um, but start on the um, the sort of basic treatments for his high histamine, get that level down and under control. And then we can start going up on the, on the HRT to the doses that are going to be the most beneficial for them. And um, that's going to vary woman to woman because yeah, do measure people's blood estradiol levels because yeah. some people absorb it really well through the skin some people don't you know we can't you can't look at a person and tell how much they're absorbing or not i mean they they might get symptoms which could give you a bit of a clue so if their estrogen is low they'll get hot flushes and night sweats but if their estrogen is too high they will also get hot flushes yeah. and sweats. so you know you it's useful to have some blood tests done and uh and then just try and manage it but we normally it it it's recognizing that there's an issue and some of these patients they don't realize they've got a histamine issue at all you know but it's fascinating how many women get to the perimenopause and say i can't drink alcohol anymore i've come off alcohol because i just it doesn't agree with me i just can't drink it anymore and it's like oh okay <laughs> you know and then when you take a history they've been progested and sensitive all their lives and yeah. they pull on the mini pill and they didn't like the combined pill and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. And they felt the best when they were pregnant because their placenta made so much diamine oxidase. And, you know, it's just it's really interesting. And I always like like asking a, a few basic questions like, you know, are you hypermobile? 80 percent will say yes. Yeah. Um, do you cut labels out of your clothes? And again, about 80 percent say yes, they do, because they're so sensitive. Do you have a strong sense of smell? And that is it usually produces a laugh because they go, oh, my God, my family just think I'm like a hound dog, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and, it, and it's, it's a really funny thing. It's just people who have this condition usually have a very acute sense of smell and sometimes bright lights and loud noises as well. They don't like so it's all the all the senses, you know, the skin, the hearing the sight everything could be affected but uh, there we go actually you know you just struck me something my uh i had i had my daughter five months ago so i've got my new little one and my oh. yeah i forgot i've got to tell you about that so i've got a five months old little one now and uh my partner she's quite interesting actually because her nose is like a, she can smell anything and honestly it's interesting watching her hormones balance out because she had ed she's had she was diagnosed with eds okay. and in interesting the link between histamine and eds is is phenomenal yeah and especially with electrolytes as well because she's been using a lot of like so like in the morning when i wake up personally we, we have this like ritual where we sprinkle a bit of sea salt into like warm water and drink it just to yeah. fill the fill the electrolytes back in the system up and yeah. since since my since my daughter's come um like you can see like the the, the histamine whenever she takes toxoprevent She's all right for a couple of days, but the minute she doesn't do anything, because I've noticed like even her her want to absorb minerals has just increased massively. 
And sometimes, like I always say, like, I don't know if you found this with like the menopause patients, do you find that they need more calories or they're craving certain things more? Well, uh, they need fewer calories usually, <laughs> 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 which is, um, which can be problematic. For or them. minerals, should I say, yeah. they crave more minerals. Yes, they, yes. I mean, I haven't noticed particularly per se, but I do know that a lot of them are deficient. Um, yeah. And when you actually ask them what they, you know, some people... And I can understand where they're coming from. They say, well, I have a healthy diet, so why do I need to take any supplements? It's like, well, do you know what? You're using up all of these vitamins and minerals every second. You're using them every day. You're depleting your stores every day. And um, and unfortunately, because of the way our farming has been over the last 2000 years, a lot of the soil hasn't been replenished in the way it should be. A lot of the microbiome of the soil is no good because of the insecticides and the pesticides and so on. So we're not getting all the goodness from our food that we used to. Um, and there's um, there's a very good uh, website called Bright Essence and they have amino acids and things that you can buy. And on there it says, um, I think it says that our, gra our, our grandparents could get the same uh, vitamin C from one orange as we would have to eat eight oranges to have the equivalent and yeah. I mean, who can eat eight or oranges I love oranges but I can't I can't eat them now because of my history in any way but you know you couldn't possibly eat enough food to give you what you need so I'm afraid supplements are a, a you know a, a fact of modern life now really and especially as you get older you know as we get older things deplete um, we don't absorb so well we don't make things so well we yeah so and who wants to get you know unwell and older certainly not but no, it's fine getting older but you just don't want to be losing your faculties <laughs> that's true yeah. tina thank you so, i mean dr Piers, dr tina Piers, thank you so much honestly it's been an absolute privilege to be able to take some of your time and be able to talk to you. And I think so many people are going to find this interview so worthwhile and so insightful. And I hope if anyone wants to, that if they do wish to just give Dr. Piers a Google, find a clinic and book an appointment because apparently she's not that busy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we... Yeah. Dilly, I, I got some lovely, lovely doctors to help me because I I was um I was starting to feel so guilty that I had to keep saying no to new patients and um I was so booked up and I had to have time to see all the the follow-ups you know and I couldn't keep seeing new patients all the time and so I actually started to um, put some feelers out and actually do you know what these doctors sort of found me they contacted me and said you know love to, love to learn what you're doing and and work with you and I was like oh yes please come and work with me yeah. um, so I've actually got a team of fantastic doctors who are seeing and they they can be booked online so if people go into menopauseconsultancy.co.uk they can book the other doctors online i can't they can't book me online because if i was online booking system it would just be crazy and um so so they have to go through my secretary to get in with me but they can book online with my wonderful colleagues and they really are and i'm learning so much from them they're fantastic they're doing functional medicine degrees and you know they're just incredible people so it's lovely yeah we're a good team that's amazing well the fact that we've you've got a team of people is amazing and i think so many people are going to want to kind of get utilize our service and honestly honestly tina i really hope that your message and what you're doing just keeps growing and as i said us at Nuva Healthcare, we're a massive advocate for you and we've appreciated all the advocation that you've given us and our products and stuff. And I hope you just continue to teach the people about everything to do with history, menopause, long COVID and, you know, just MCAS really. Oh, well, thank you, Dilly. I'll do my best. <laughs> thank you. Dina, thank you. Well, it's going to pause this now. <laughs>